Welcome to the Art of Retouching Studio. My name is John Ross and this is Behind the Retouching. This particular image was commissioned to me by Photoshop Creative Magazine for issue number 125. They had wanted me to write an article on portrait retouching. When it comes to portrait retouching, there are many different styles that you can do. There's studio, there's beauty, there's fashion, and each of those has a different style attached to it. Some are brighter, some are darker, some are more creative than others. In this particular image, I went with a beauty retouch, which meant that my goal was to make this girl as perfect as I could while still retaining the realistic aspects of the photograph, which ultimately leads us to the perfect portrait. So let's get started all the way back at the beginning. When you drag and drop a raw image into Adobe Photoshop, it actually opens it up inside of Camera Raw first. Now inside of Camera Raw, we can make a variety of different changes, both global and targeted. However, in many cases, I simply use it as a way to balance out exposure inside of an image. When we look at this image, you can see that it is in fact overexposed. There's some brighter areas as well as sharper contrasts that's happening due to the lighting. Now on set, the photographer was trying to go with one look and so he's playing with the lighting and doing whatever he wants. But now in the retouching side, it is my job as the retoucher in order to balance out this image and correct any flaws. So my goal at this point is basically to flatten out the image, give it a nice baseline so that the brights aren't too bright and the darks aren't too dark. And I achieve that by adjusting the exposure shadows and blacks. By bringing down the exposure so that it takes that brightness out of the image. But I compensate for that by brightening up the shadows. So I am lightening the areas that I just darkened with the exposure. And once I lighten that up, it actually flattens out the image. And so I'll drop down the blacks to add contrast back into it. And here you can see this is the before and the after. Before and after. It comes off as a little bit dark, but I will adjust that inside of Photoshop. If this was the first time I was opening the image inside of Photoshop, down here I would have a button that says Open Image. You can alternatively hold down the Shift key and that's going to give you Open Object, which is how I work because it's going to create a smart object for me. And the smart object inside of Photoshop will ultimately allow me to go back into Camera Raw and make further changes if needed. If you hit Open Image, it's going to flatten the image and give us a pixel-based background. But however you prefer to achieve it, you would click the button and open up inside of Adobe Photoshop. Because I work off of smart objects, Photoshop is going to retain the name that came from the file as opposed to just naming it background. And you could also tell it's a smart object by the funny little icon down here. Now there are many benefits to using smart objects, but the real reason that I use smart objects is so that I can attach filters to each of these layers and retain their settings as well. And that allows me to jump back and forth between any of these settings that I've already created. If you would like to learn more about smart objects, you can go to my website, theartofretouching.com, and there you can find a video that talks about smart objects and smart filters in great detail. But at this point, all you really need to know is this is a smart object, and attached to it is a smart filter. And in this case, the filter is ImageNomic Portraiture. Many professionals would never dream of using a plugin that's going to damage the skin. However, like any other tool, you're only going to do damage if you let the tool do damage. For me, my settings are very soft, subtle, and all I do is take the edge off. If you would like to learn more about how I use ImageNomic Portraiture, once again, you can find it on my website, theartofretouching.com, and there I walk you through the specific settings that I use for portraiture. At the end of the day, it comes down to this. I would rather spend 30 seconds doing something as opposed to three hours. And as long as I do it soft, subtle, and controlled, no one needs to know I did it at all. Here, let me show you what it actually does. I'm gonna turn off the effect, zoom in. Up here on her forehead, despite the wrinkles and blemishes that you see at this point, you should be able to see like some slight discolorations, patches of pink and purple that are going through her skin. But once I run a soft pass of portraiture over the top of this, you can see that it simply just kind of smoothed it out a little bit. This is before and after. Before and after. Again, it's subtle. You don't even notice it at this point unless I turn it off and then it just beats you over the head with the discoloration. 
So above this, I made a duplicate smart object, and once again, I attached another level of portraiture to the top of this. Now, the reason that I need to do that is because I wanted a subtle effect of portraiture here, but I want a stronger effect of portraiture in certain areas that needed a little bit more help. However, I can't put them on the same layer because I needed this separate masking in order to separate areas. So I made a duplicate of the smart object, and then I applied a stronger level of portraiture to this smart object, and then I applied a mask to it. And the mask looks like this. So the areas that are red are stopping the effect, and the clear areas allow the effect to come in. And the effect is to soften the skin and the hair. I'll zoom in and show you what the difference is. Because the camera is capturing every single skin tone, pore, and hair as it goes across her face and wraps around the back of her head, we basically have too much detail. Visually, it's too much information. So what normally can happen on a camera is you could adjust the aperture and that creates a depth of field where you can keep the face in focus but allow the back of the head to drop out of focus. However, in a studio setup, when you have strobe lights, those are so bright you need to adjust the aperture so it doesn't get too bright and overexpose the image. But when you do that, it's going to leave the entire image sharp. So one of the ways that I compensate for that is to do a stronger portraiture and I apply that mask to it. And it looks like this. So once again, this is before and after. Before and after. Basically, you can still see all the hair. I haven't blurred anything. I just gave it a soft glistening, a, a, a welcome softness to it. In many cases, you don't need to see the detail. You just need to see the shape and the colors. Because if you get too much information, it's going to distract you from the focal point of the image. The focal point should be her face, which means everything else can be softer because we don't need all that excess information. And in fact, that's exactly what the next layer up is doing to a much more dramatic degree. This layer on top is once again another smart object, but this time the effect is attached to a blur gallery. And this is going to give it a dramatic softening. So let me show you how that is set up. Here you can see that I used an iris blur of 15 pixels. And the way that this works is everything inside of the circle is going to remain absolutely sharp. Everything outside of the circle gets very soft, and everything between here is just a vignette from zero softness to 15 pixels of softness, and it just gradiates off. So this allows us to be focused in on her face and start omitting the details in the back. However, because of the way the filter works, this bit of hair, which should be nice and sharp, actually gets pulled into the softness. Now because of that, we need to create masks around certain parts of this image in order to better honor the depth of field being this plane and not this plane. By using this as a mask, where the red is being concealed and the clear is allowing that blurring effect to happen, you'll be able to see this effect. This is before and this is after. Before and after. As you can see, I just soften everything as, as it goes around the back of her head. Additionally, I'm softening up the areas down here in her blouse. Technically, it's all in the same plane, so she would actually be much sharper down here, but there's no reason for us to visually see all the detail that goes on down here. Once again, it detracts from us being focused up in her face. So by softening it down here, it keeps our eye focused up higher to where it needs to stay. At this point, I need to do more work to the image, but I want to do it to each of these layers combined together. While many retouchers might use a flatten image or a merge layers or something like that, however, I prefer a non-destructive approach. And I do that by selecting all of the layers together, right-clicking, and going down to Convert to Smart Object. And what that's going to do is it's going to take these three loose layers with all the smart filters and combine them into a single layer as a smart object that I can continue to work on. But it's going to retain each of these settings and smart filters, and I can even go back to the original raw file if I need to. Again, if you don't understand, watch the video on smart objects, and it will explain everything. 
So once I do convert those three layers into a single smart object, I can now run another smart filter over the top of the whole thing. And the filter that I need to use is going to be unsharp mask. So basically, I'm going to sharpen the image. And the reason that I need to sharpen this image is to bring out all of the skin detail. I'm going to zoom in so you can see it nice and clear. And when I zoom in on the skin, you can see the detail, but it's soft. But by applying unsharp mask to it, you can see that I bring out all of that fine detail. This is before and after. Before and after. Because this is a smart filter, I can double click on the unsharp mask and it's going to open up the dialog box and show you the settings that I used, which was simply an amount of 100%, a radius of two, and a threshold of two. See that? A benefit of the smart object and smart filters is I could go right back in here, make the change, and then go forward, no matter where I am in my production. It's pretty awesome. But at this point, we have a problem. She has really, really bad skin. And she has all these wavy lines that run across her cheeks as well as her nose. So the only way to compensate for that is to do what's called skin grafting, which is generally either taking parts of the skin from the same image, a similar image, or in this case, I needed to go to a completely different image of a completely different model. And the reason for that is simple. The amount of work that is required in order to remove all these lines by hand is absolutely insane. I tried it for a little bit, I realized it was an uphill battle, and I knew that skin grafting was a much better way to achieve what I wanted to. So basically, I took a completely different image from a completely different person, and I scaled it, and I rotated it, and dropped it over the top. When I zoom in up close, you can see that I've tried to line up this area right here. Other parts fall off, but all I'm really caring about is this right here. And I did have to just stretch it a little bit in order to make it fit, but it fits well enough for my purposes. I then put a mask over the top of this because I obviously don't need the entire image. So here it is with the mask. This is before and after. Before and after. You can see that we have a discoloration to the skin, and that's expected. It's from a different person on a different day with different lighting. But we will compensate for that discoloration by using Selective Color, where I add 16 yellow into the skin tones. It's subtle, but it is there. But the big move is going to be curves, where I darken up the lights as well as the midtones, and that gives it a much better match. So here's before and after, before and after. Now I can certainly still see some areas that need correction, but we'll deal with that on the cloning layer, where we'll end up blending all this together seamlessly. When it came to the lips, once again, you can see that they're way too sharp. There's just too much detail going on. Additionally, she has this indent in her lips that leaves it uneven. So now the inside of this folder gets a bit complicated, and I really don't want to get into the details. But in short, here's how I softened up the lips. I have a layer of Gaussian Blur, which removes a lot of that detail. And then I also have a high pass that puts a lot of that detail right back into it. I have another strange layer here, which gives it a soft glistening effect, as well as this layer here that adds a little bit of shine back into it. Again, I really don't want to go into this much detail for this video, but simply, this is before and this is after. Before and after. And we finish up this section by finally doing a cloning layer to remove all of the blemishes. And that layer looks like this. As you can see, I do many little small brush strokes in order to achieve the look. And I do my best to honor the curvature of the face. But we really need to worry about all these potholes as well as excess lines that are on her face. But all that gets taken care of with a cloning layer. This is before and after. Before and after. Now the two tools that I'm doing my cloning with, uh, one of which is the healing brush tool, which is a pretty amazing tool. It allows us to grab a source and paste it into a destination. 
but it matches the color, the tone, and texture as best as it can and mixes the pixels together that gives us a nice seamless effect. The other tool that I would use is a standard clone stamp, but that one is more of a one-to-one -one match between the source and the destination. So it's a bit harder to use than the healing brushes because the healing brush is a lot more forgiving. When I come over to the other side of her face, you can see this is before and after. Before and after. And even up here, I just adjust the blending a bit better. So here it was a little bit of abrupt change in there, and here it's just smoother. Now once again, like before, I need to do more effects onto this image. So rather than flattening things, I much prefer to select all of these layers, right click and go convert to smart object. And now that I've converted this image to another smart object, I can once again put more filters onto this and continue the work that I'm doing based off of the smart object as a single entity instead of many loose layers that it really is. But I can still retain the editability of every single layer that I created all the way back to the original raw file. It's pretty amazing. If you don't know how this works, definitely go check out my video at theartofretouching.com. So the next filter that I apply to this is Liquify. Now try and remember, just because you have a filter like Liquify that allows you to push and pull the pixels as if they were putty, doesn't mean that you need to go crazy with it. You don't always need to be grabbing everybody and squishing them in and making them thinner and thinner. Sometimes it could just be used for small, subtle changes. And in this case, the subtle change is this. This is before and this is after. Before and after. Yeah, you see it right there, just that little bit right there. I just kind of push it in. See, you don't have to go crazy with this stuff. Okay, moving on. This blouse is incredibly bright, and no matter what you do, it's very distracting. So I use this layer here, which is a hue saturation with a desaturation of 23, in order to tone down that bright orange. See, before and after. Now this does two very specific things. One, visually, it just helps stop your eye from being pulled down because it's no longer a dominating factor within the image. And the second thing it's doing is putting in a lot more detail back into the subtle areas down here so that you don't see this, rather you're going to see this. See that? See how much more detail gets put back into the image? Because this is going to be printed on a press, it's going to be converted from RGB, red, green, and blue, into CMYK, say magenta, yellow, and black. Basically, it's a much smaller color mode than RGB is. What that ultimately means is this bright orange is never going to print. It is going to be converted to something like this anyway. The difference is that I am in control of it at this point and I tell it how far to go and what color to be as opposed to letting some auto convert thing on the tail end of the process make this conversion for me because who knows what we would have come up with. The next set of layers up is going to be dealing with the skin. We're going to be working with light sculpting otherwise known as dodge and burn. Now there's many different ways to be doing dodge and burn. There's not just one way to do it. There's several of them. This is the way that I did it. The first thing I do is add more yellow into the skin tones because basically she's looking a little pink so I add some yellow to put some color back into her skin before and after. I also adjust the exposure on her face. It looks quite severe at this point because we haven't looked at the rest of the light sculpting layers, but simply this is a first step in order to brighten up her face. Always keep in mind that brights come forward and darks go backward. So by making her face brighter, it immediately catches your eye and keeps you focused in on it. Because right now it is the brightest part in the image, which is often what you want. Just be careful not to make it too bright. Right now it looks too bright, but we're not done yet because we still have to even out the rest of these shadows in her face. And that comes from the layers inside of this light sculpting folder. Inside of here I have two curves. The first curve is a darkened curve, and it basically brings the midtones straight down, and that's going to darken the entire image. And we have another layer here called lighten, and in this case I'm going in the other direction, so now I'm lightening the entire image. So without masks, darken is going to darken everything and lighten is going to lighten everything. Now because I'm making such a severe shift to 
to the image, I want to point out that I changed the layer blend mode from normal to luminosity because here's the difference. Here's normal and you can see how it changes the color as opposed to luminosity which handles it quite differently. That this is normal and this is luminosity. And then once again here's your lighten layer and the lighten layer is also set to luminosity because this is normal which gives you a color distortion. Now keep in mind that these severe changes for both of these layers are being controlled by the mask and it's the mask that controls how much of that bright or darkness gets entered into the image and where it gets entered into. I'm going to turn off the masks. So now here's going to be the darken mask and all the clear areas is where I'm darkening up the image which are more than likely the brightest areas. So here's the effect. You can see this is before and after. Before and after. It's pretty subtle but it definitely added a little bit more drama and intensity to certain areas of the face. When it comes to the lighten areas, this is the mask. And I'm basically trying to lighten up this darker shadow that's going on down the side of her face. And I achieved that with this. Before and after. As you can see, these two layers are balancing out this heavy exposure that's going on. So it doesn't look nearly as dramatic. And overall, this is the skin move. This is before and after. Before and after. It's more dramatic and it's brighter inside of her face than anywhere else in the image. But when I do that, I'm sure you can't help but notice how dark her eyes have gotten. They've become sunken in her face. But luckily, we have a layer called eyes that take care of that. So let's take a look at those. Now the big shift is this curve layer, which is going to brighten it up with a mask that looks like this. And put together, you're going to get this. See, no longer is it dark, but it's simply more balanced for the image. Now the next two layers up address a common problem that happens in many portraits. And that's the fact that she doesn't have very many eyelashes. You know, it just looks kind of weak and it's a bit clumpy with the mascara. So the way to compensate for that is to take a Wacom tablet with a paintbrush of only like one or two pixels and start adding in eyelashes. And the first layer up is black eyelashes. So as you can see, I manually went in there and I put in some extra black eyelashes. Did that over there and I did that over here as well. Now arguably this starts looking a little bit dark. I understand that. So then we come back in with white eyelashes. And by doing that over the top, it compensates for that constant darkness. And it gives it a little bit more of a broken up pattern. Before and after. This is before any of the eye work and after. Before and after. As you can see, all I'm really doing is softly and subtly bringing back different areas of lightness to compensate for the darkness. In no way have I flattened out her face. In no way have I lost any of the details of the pores in her skin. Absolutely not. But I'm pushing back the severity of what we started with, which was very contrasted lighting. And I'm balancing it out and adding the lights and darks where I want them to be. The last few layers I put into a folder called OA, which just means overall. Now the changes that you're going to see aren't specifically overall. I simply put it on at the end and said this is the last of it. But inside of here, we have two layers. We have a contrast and we have a lighten. I'm going to start with lighten because I want to show you something special in contrast. But the lighten just does that. I mean, simply all I did is just lighten it. Nothing special going on. But contrast, if you can look at this mask, you can see that I added contrast across certain areas. Now, the goal here was that I'm adding a brightness just to these targeted areas here. So I'm lightening the skin a little bit. I'm lightening certain areas of the hair. But then I also did this. Now this is interesting to note because when I'm finished it looks like this. And I'm sure you can see exactly what happened. Running off the side of her face we have this discoloration. 
When you look at it up close, you really don't see it, which is how I was working. I didn't realize what I had done. Luckily, before I was finished, I did see this halo effect that I accidentally made, and I corrected it before it went out the door to the printing. If I had missed this, I would have been so upset with myself. But luckily, I did see it, and I was able to compensate for it, and I didn't make that mistake. And in this case, I'll simply go to my brush and cover over it. Now, you can see the final intended effect was before and after. Before and after. And I did this specifically because when I finished at this point, I felt that the image still looked a little bit muddy, it was a little dark, and when it goes to press, I know it's going to get darker on top of that. So, I brightened the image up and called this image done. And so now here you can see that we have the before and the after. So overall, you should be able to see some clear improvements to the image from what it was out of the camera versus how I finished up working on the image. If you'd like to watch more behind the scenes videos just like this one, or if you would like to watch videos about Photoshop in general, please go to www.theartofretouching.com where you can find more tips and tricks to make you a better photo retoucher.